Okay, good morning, everyone. So we're gonna uh, go ahead and get started with our DOE allocation uh, manager presentations. Uh, we have um, several allocation managers um, who are gonna be giving some um, information about uh, sort of upcoming priorities uh, for their field, for their, for their uh, allocations. Um, and we're gonna go ahead and start with Matthias Graf, who is the uh, allocation manager for BES. So Matthias, feel free to share your screen. Okay, well, thank you. I'll get it up and running. Yep. Uh, let's see if it's uh, on your side visible. Yep. Okay, it's good perfect. morning. Thank you. Good morning and uh, good afternoon, wherever you are. Uh, it is my pleasure to, to give you the, the allocation manager perspective here. And uh, yesterday you heard about on how to write an effective air cap proposal. So I, I think sort of, I will not cover that, but I will talk about on how to write a successful one. <laughs> okay, uh, I am sort of talking here at, at the user group meeting and uh, this is the, the perspective from the of the program office, basic energy sciences. So you will hear the other program officers present uh, after my presentation. And uh, in what capacity am I here? I'm here as the as the lead for basic energy sciences uh, for the allocation managers with respect to NERSC. But I also uh, carry a hat that is uh, I'm a program manager within the office of basic energy sciences. And so. I wanna sort of break this into two parts uh, is this presentation. And I wanna let you sort of see on what are our perspectives and then our future. And this is really determined by the mission statement of basic energy sciences and its research that it supports. And uh, so I wanna say something about understanding our mission and program priorities, which determines our funding or allocation of computing but as well as our allocation uh, for computing. And uh, to break this down on what is might or how this might look like for you is uh, we have in BES uh, different core programs that we fund. We have special topics that we fund, but we also have other programs, uh, specific programs that we support. And so depending on where your research falls, uh, you should keep an eye on, on those aspects. Uh, and then I want to sort of in the second part, which is to, uh, I want to then come to the ERCAP proposal writing tips. And this is really sort of like, how do you not just write an effective, but how do you write a successful one? Uh, that you provide the information that the allocation manager and the program managers need to know in order to make a, uh, an educated, not just an educated, uh, a technical decision on, on why your proposal is deserving the, the amount you're asking for. So... And there's a change within basic energy sciences. We, we studied this year now, after a pilot, uh, we, we started to implement a new uh, allocation process for proposals. And we say that only one and only one air cap proposal uh, is to be submitted for a research grant or award. So I will use grant and award in the same, same way here. Grants are typically university awards. Uh, but this applies to National Laboratory FWP awards as well. So there's a specific difference for BES, one and only one ERCAP proposal per research grant. The other thing is I want to really get the message uh, to you, and uh, it's important that you know your BES program manager, uh, and that we're looking and give high priority to active grants or award, and that you need to provide the correct number in your application, in your ERCAP proposal. As well as if you are not the lead PI of the DOE, the BES research grant, provide that information in the form of listing that person as a senior investigator so that we actually know who we have to, to work with in, in case we need to come back about the, how it aligns with the, the research grant, what you propose for the NERSC computing allocations. Then the other part I want to talk about is the, the NERSC CPU and GPU computing allocations. These are done separately. So, and uh, year after year in BS, they have been oversubscribed multiple times. So it's a very, very competitive process. So the, the better and more uh, justified, better articulated your proposal is, the easier it is for us to evaluate in comparison to other of those many proposals that we receive. 
And finally, again, uh, if you have received BES funding in a grant, award, FWP, uh, then we usually have you give you a higher priority to get as much allocations as is possible, considering the large uh, applications numbers that we receive and the limited resources that we have. And so you should know by now, Evan, after you have gone to the NERSC webpage on who the allocation managers are. This is the people who really manage the allocations, handing, then handing out, assigning this. Uh, so the, for the chemical sciences, and geosciences and biosciences, Aaron Holder. For material sciences and engineering, it is myself, Matthias Graf, as well as my colleague, Claudia Muse. And for the scientific user facility, it is Van Gwyn. And these are the people who you usually have to contact about allocation questions, about application questions that go beyond, uh, that go about the, the, the science aspect. Uh, for, for technical reasons, uh, if you need to have issues with, with submission or whatever, it's of course that the NERSC support staff to ask. Uh, let me go then to the, the really important question is on how to write a successful proposal. An aircraft proposal is by finding a home for your aircraft proposal in the first place. And uh, I highly recommend that you go and look at the website. It's uh, science.osti.gov, BES, and this describes the BES program. And it's big, so uh, therefore I just want to say uh, it comes to the key message what we're looking for, which is that a priority is to understand, predict, and ultimately control matter and energy at the electronic, atomic, and molecular levels. So this is sort of if your work, if you want to submit to the BS category, uh, this is what you should have in mind. And if your research falls in this which you should know by now if you have a research grant already from us, or if you don't have one, uh, make sure that this is well and clearly communicated to the program managers uh, in your application. And why is this important? Uh, because BES's mission fulfills uh, the support of basic research to discover new materials and design new chemical processes that underpin a range of new energy technologies. It also operates world-class scientific user facilities like X-ray, neutron, and electron beam scattering, as well as the nanoscale science research centers. Uh, I'm not gonna talk today about the construction and upgrades, which is a, a different topic and not part of the, the NERSC proposal process. Uh, then it comes down to, once you have sort of figured out where you fit in the, into the space of, of BES uh, on that, you compete against many, many, many others. Uh, we've in BES fund about 1,500 active research grants and awards. So it's a very large number of applications that we receive in order to advance knowledge and make discoveries in, in, in the physical sciences. And of course we operate 12 national user facilities as I mentioned before uh, through the scientific user facility and they have some needs to provide user support in general, which also involves some computational support. Uh, and to give you the idea sort of what this looks like uh, to understand the mission and program priorities and where you might find your a home for your aircraft proposal is that you know which divisions you fall under in the basic energy sciences program office. There's on the left side, you see this box, material sciences and engineering division. Is broken into three teams, and you will find if you drill down, I've got a page where you can see where your program office uh, or the program, yeah, what the program is that you will work with your uh, program manager. There's the scientific user facility, and here this is only about the operations. And then to the, the third box over is the chemical sciences, geosciences, and biosciences division, which has three teams where your research will may fall under. And then we have a new uh, stood up. Uh, Division on collaborative research. This is where we have the Energy Frontier Research Centers, the Energy Innovation Hubs, the Energy Earthshot Research Centers. And uh, those are a little different so far because it's sort of in the, in the transition stand-up process. So here it is really important if you have a proposal that let's say ties to a research, an energy frontier research center, make sure you call this out clearly in the application and you call out who is your program manager. So we can direct this to the right program manager for the review. Uh, 
Now let's take a look, drill down and look at the material sciences and engineering division. So these are the people working there. So I said, we have three teams across, as I mentioned before, and under each team, we have multiple programs or core research areas. And these are the program managers. And I just here at the left top, materials chemistry, you have Craig Henderson and Chris Jurvin, and you can go through this list on who will be for your research topic, the right program manager. And you can find the program description for each of these uh, areas on our website. So if you're not sure, all this information you can find on the website, as I mentioned before. Then let me go further down. For the chemistry division, we have, okay, let me see, where am I here? For the chemical sciences, geoscience and geosciences division, same uh, arrangement. We have three teams uh, organized uh, by, by topics and disciplines. And again, find out who is your program manager, find out what is the program that they manage, look at the description of their research. And uh, from there, you can go on and write a very strong and convincing proposal because they will evaluate uh, or help us evaluate your, your application. And finally, the scientific user facilities division, uh, they are the operation side is the box on the left. These are the, 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 the people you should know. There is uh, for X-ray neutron and the nanoscale sciences centers. This is David Kevney, uh, Misha Chanikov, and Yiping Feng. Uh, Van Nguyen, I already mentioned, she's the allocation manager and for the accelerator and detector research, uh, Eliane Lesta. And uh, again, their program and research area descriptions are available on the website. How, how do we sort of break this out? So we have in BS basically a large core research uh, effort, which is this about 1,500 awards. Uh, in addition to that, we have the Energy Frontier Research Centers. Uh, Again, they have their computational needs. We have now just started Energy Earthshot Research Centers. Uh, this is coming online and I will expect some application from that. And we have a significant amount of computational needs for our computational materials and chemical sciences uh, centers and projects. And this is a, a very large priority for us to support them with the production runs they need. And in addition, uh, we have uh, energy hubs. Uh, currently we have the, the energy storage and fuels from sunlight hubs. And just this year we competed or recompeted the, the batteries and energy storage hub. Uh, so that is still in progress. In addition to that, we have also the QIS research centers, the national QIS research centers, which are large and hub-like uh, big uh, awards. And they have their computational needs as well. So we try to sort of therefore prioritize based on those needs, uh, the, the magnitude of those activities, the allocation of computing time. Now the tips, this is the part two, the tips is about uh, the aircap proposal writing and uh, how do you make it as easy for us who the program managers and the allocation managers to assess your proposal. And uh, it helps a lot when you fill out the application and you pay attention to just starts already with the funding information. And when you get to this slide uh, about funding, is sort of the, is for us the, the first level to see is it who is funding it. For example, in our case, primarily there's a DOE Office of Science funded activities. If you submit it to BES, I would assume you would have uh, funding from the, our office, uh, BES. Then you should fill out in this, as I should show here, the, the name of your program manager, uh, because this is who we're gonna contact about uh, the, the importance and priority of, of your proposal in, in this very competitive process. And then of course, we want to know if you have your grant number, and I just put it in some XXX at the end, or if it's an FWP number, or if it's not a grant yet, uh, maybe you have the uh, application pro, uh, proposal number, the PAMS number. Uh, so please provide this information in this place. If you're not funded yet, then there's this question by us or by then there's this opportunity to, you can list your either other funding, uh, you have LDRD funding at the national laboratory, or you have some state or local government funding or, or a university startup funding. But this is information that we all use in assessing and uh, prioritizing each proposal compared to the hundreds of those that we receive. Uh, what is important to us, especially now that we moved to this model that the NERSC 
RCAP proposal and therefore a successful user project follows the money, which means it's tied to a specific research grant or award. So therefore we would like, and we want to know who are the senior investigators in your application. And we really ask you to, to list the lead PI because if you don't list the lead PI, we will mostly just uh, send it back to you to redraft or decline it because we cannot make the, the decision uh, at, at this level who and how this is uh, important to the BES research priorities. In the tab on the project details, uh, pay attention again to the project summary and goals. This should be the science on why this is the most exciting thing you're proposing uh, to, to request computing time for. And don't just simply repeat what the science you want to do in the detailed description for the DOE managers. This goes to the program manager uh, who is responsible for this research area. This could be your program manager where you have your research grant or someone who you might like to submit an application in the future. And this is for that person to see how the major goals, uh, how the objectives of what you propose in the NERSC proposal aligns with the research grant that you were funded or would you have a proposal pending with the, the program manager? Then the next part is often, which is kind of treated as a little bit as a, as a step child, is the accomplishment summary. What we'd like to hear from you there to make our evaluation is how does in a renewal proposal, so this is for renewals only, uh, not for new, only renewals, how does the progress that you have made in the prior year uh, relate to, to the work that you sort of proposed? but uh, only to the prior year. Don't list whatever you have done years before or many years prior to this. This is uh, not relevant for this evaluation. The refereed publications, I mean, it says refereed and we always struggle with the people like to say, well, what about my non referee Only list the refereed publications with a DOI and make sure it must list and acknowledge NERSC. If it doesn't acknowledge NERSC, it's not, uh, an accomplishment to, to, to present in this, this space. Uh, finally, when you have materials that is not published, that goes into the non-referee uh, materials section, this is where you can put the unpublished, submit it under review, but even that, it must list and acknowledge NERSC. Finally, the supporting information, uh, uh, sorry, the resources, I wanna say resources, the readiness, justification, and computing credit, don't just throw out a number of how many hours you need justify and provide the reasoning why you need those hours. Uh, otherwise, we will send it back because we cannot assess the, the validity of the requested compute hours. And please make sure that you use node hours for GPUs as well as for CPUs and not some outdated and uh, obsolete NERSC hours. Finally, supporting information. If you have other high-performance computing support, access to resources listed at this place, if it is used for this research that is proposed here, uh, because we will need to figure this into our assessment. And uh, finally, the codes, please make sure that you provide description that uh, your program manager can understand what the code is, the name, what you can read about it, and, and what the code does in a brief description. And finally, this is the, the point uh, we usually and too often receive uh, unrealistic requests, uh, probably because uh, everybody assumes that they receive a cut of their request anyhow. But try to size your request as close as what you really think you need because our uh, computational resources are finite. And this is the table that you also find uh, on the NERSC web page for, for the RCAP process on how many millions of hours we have available for C CPU node or GPU node hours. And uh, put this in context that we typically are multiple times oversubscribed, receiving hundreds of RCAP proposals. So it's unlikely that any one person will get 10% or even 5% of any of these maximum numbers that you see listed here. This is the constraints we work with. And if you do need more than what you see here, or a significant chunk of what you see here is there's always uh, other venues with the OSCAR programs like the AL ALCC or the INSIGHT program. If you really need access to large amounts of computing at those machines, use that venue uh, 
NERSC is our primary production machine with limited uh, set, uh, resources for a large number of uh, researchers that we, we support. And these are hundreds. With that, I, I am done here. I, I'm happy to take questions. Thank you. Question in the room. If you project, I think okay. you, you will be heard. Okay. Uh, thank you, Matthias. So I have two questions. So one is um, how do you or basic energy sciences in general feel about funding industry as opposed to academia? Okay, the, the, we do we do have very, very, very few of those cases. Uh, they have to perform research that is published in order to sort of, there's a, there's a process that NERSC has established in order to get the, the usual uh, RCAP uh, process and, and, and use of projects. It's, it's rare, I must say, because they usually go through, let's say special uh, requests through the ALCC or INSIGHT. But they are everybody is eligible to apply, okay. and they sh and they should definitely make clear on why this is important for the mission of BES research. And is, does that carry over for like monetary funding as well? Uh, the monetary funding is like uh, let me put it this way: it can be uh, if it's a private entity, or as I said, it's, it has to be published work. Yep. Uh, the, the money is, I mean, we, we don't provide research, we don't provide dollars, there, there's sort of, uh, yeah, there's, there's no money that we provide, we provide in this case with the nurse process only computing allocations. So I'm um, not sure I understood that second part therefore, but this, uh, this is only about computing allocations, if, but the, you do not have to have uh, a research grant or award from BES in order to be eligible for an application. Uh, you may not get the same amount as a as an active research uh, request. So, uh, um, so hi, Matthias, this is Richard. Let me let me add a couple of things. One is that um, NERSC also does have a, it's not that big, but it does have a, a industrial partnership program. So if there is, um, if, the, if there's industry that wants access to um, they, should, they can they can talk to me or, or send something to consult at NERSC and um, as long as it's uh, in the in the office of science mission space it's we can we can work something out and then um, I will also mention that the office of science does also have a um, SBIR a small business uh, program so it's a small business you might check out those opportunities as well thank you yeah that's a very good points Richard uh, so there's additional venues Yes, Peter. I have a question, and you may not be the right person, but you stressed at the beginning one and only one per cap uh, request per um, DOE grant. Is yes. that specific for BES, or do you happen to know if the other sciences also use that rule? Uh, this is this is uh, specific at, at this point to BES only, and it doesn't. Okay, it is. Specific in the sense that we say it's a it's one per DOE grant, but it can also one per NSF grant, one per DOE, yeah. E E R E, one per uh, DOD grant. So we, we try what we try to do here is instead of having PIs with multiple research grants, say okay, we're going to do all these calculations now. Is that we want to find out on how are we allocating our resources to our primarily our research grants and to others. Okay. So it's, it's basically to keep track of where the money goes so that we don't have to uh, look at, uh, at the vegetable medley and trying to figure out where, where and what our allocations are being used for. Thanks. Great, any other questions? <clears throat> What's the best way? Because it seems like there's a lot of overlap between all of the different sub programs. You know, sometimes I read the descriptions and they seem very similar. So, yes. what's the best way to identify where you fit? Okay, the, the first thing is if you already fund it, you should know who your program manager is and therefore which, which box you, program box you fall. If you are not funded at this point, then you 
might want to ask this program manager to, if this falls into this area. I would just like uh, just write an email. If this is the research you want to do. Does this would this fall into this uh, area? That's the best approach to get sort of the right uh, assignment because in the end we're going to ask this program manager: Is this true that this is a priority in your program? And uh, the program manager must say, "No, not really." Or yes, absolutely. Okay. Thank you. Okay, great. Um, and I didn't see any questions online. Um, so if there are no last minute questions, uh, we can move on um, to our next presentation. Thank you so much, Matthias. That was a very informative presentation. Um, all right, so our next presenter is Michael Halfmoon, who is the allocation manager for FES. Um, feel free to share your screen. Okay, does that does that work? Because can everyone see this now? Yes, perfect. Thank you so right. much. Uh, thank you very much for having me. Uh, I'm Michael Halfmoon. I'm the Theory and Simulation Program Manager for the Fusion Energy Sciences uh, Division at the Office of Science uh, within the Department of Energy. And I'll just be uh, presenting some of our allocation priorities and uh, perspectives. So start off, uh, the theory and simulation division is really kind of divided into two uh, kind of separate but rather equal programs that are the, ba we have the base theory, which focuses on, you know, the uh, uh, advancing in scientific, the scientific understanding of the physical processes of magnetically confined plasmas. It's uh, this research range, has a very wide range from analytic theory to large scale HPC efforts. And we also have the SIDAC program, uh, which is a collaboration with Oscar, and it's uh, aimed at accelerating the scientific discovery uh, by capitalizing on the SC investments in, this, in the leadership class computing systems, such as uh, NERSC and uh, OLCF and ALCF as well. So we've recently expanded this to cover uh, whole facility modeling efforts, as well as uh, tokamak magnetic fusion energy and inertial fusion energy configurations. And one thing that really links both of these kind of uh, programs together is the access and application of NERSC HPC uh, resources. So just uh, touching on some of the exascale computing for fusion energy science, uh, we've made a, a lot of these advancements in large scale efforts have resulted in the advent of this new era of uh, GPU based computing. And successes within the exascale computing project have delivered some valuable lessons for a lot of future uh, research efforts and utilizing and optimizing uh, these HPC codes for GPU platforms are going to be essential uh, moving forward for both uh, the FES theory and SIDAC programs. Uh, just touching on the programmatic breadth of FES, so a NERSC users uh, are served by the Fusion Energy Sciences ERCAP allocation extend beyond just the theory and simulation division. Uh, some of the topical areas that uh, we currently support uh, via ERCAP uh, awards include uh, material science, so just some examples here, uh, the plasma and materials interaction studies, as well as simulations of material under high, uh, extreme conditions, um, neutronics and blanket technologies, uh, effects of wall irradiation, and some studies of liquid lithium breeder blankets, uh, turbulence and transport, uh, so for example, multi-scale gyrokinetic studies of both uh, core and edge turbulence, inertial fusion energy, uh, we've got PIC simulations of uh, target kinetics, uh, stellarator science, so things like a lot of machine learning optimization, of, like these non-axisymmetric confining fields have been uh, become really popular in the, the last few years. Uh, general plasma science, uh, just as an example of something we support, uh, simulations of astrophysical magnetic reconnection and a kind of burgeoning program uh, that we uh, are supporting under the general plasma science umbrella um, includes uh, plasma processing for microelectronics. And additionally, uh, we support efforts uh, from the milestone program. So these are the public-private partnerships that uh, 
uh, were, were just uh, funded this year. So everything in bold in this list, those are funded, uh, those are uh, handled by other uh, program managers within FES. So even though, the, like Matthias said, there uh, are several program managers, but for, uh, for FES, there's just one allocations manager that handles <coughs> all of the nurse resources and, and their allocations. So I co coordinate pretty extensively with them uh, to determine the priorities of uh, what to give allocation time to. So uh, preparing your ERCAP requests. So as Matthias showed in his presentation, the dialogue boxes that you'll be filling out uh, when submitting an ERCAP request, we do ask that within the code, uh, that you include information on the code usage. So please clearly identify the names of the codes that are being used and uh, tell us whether or not they're open source. And give an estimate for the resource requirements for a standard simulation uh, using this software. Uh, research details, they list any DOE and other funding sources uh, connected to your allocation request. And we also ask that you identify any graduate students that will be uh, using allocated resources for uh, dissertation uh, research. And in the tab for the GPU and CPU hours, Ensure that your request is consistent with your usage estimates. Um, if GPU capable, prioritize requesting those GPU node hours over the CPU nodes. And just an, a quick note to any PIs, uh, don't be discouraged if this initial allocation is lower than requested. Uh, you'll have opportunities throughout the year uh, to have access to some of the reserve node hours uh, due to the quarterly clawbacks that NERSC does. So just to, to touch on some of the priorities uh, within, the, within FES. So all awards uh, funded under FES are eligible for support uh, to, uh, from our the FES ERCAP allocation, things like general science, milestone awards, material science, et cetera. So private companies are eligible for ERCAP rewards if no intellectual property is produced from the resulting simulations. Priority is given to projects that utilize codes which are already optimized for HPC resources, have a track record of utilizing their allocation in previous cycles if they're a renewal, are connected to awards whose research efforts would be impossible without re uh, HPC resources. A lot of the side acts cannot be done without access to at least some uh, 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 supercomputing resources. And you know, we prioritize things that support graduate student research and request allocations that correspond to the usage requirements of their codes. Uh, we, we know that some codes uh, require large uh, amounts of resources. And typically, we recommend that those uh, seek out ALCC or inside awards. And prior, uh, some of the priorities for the reserves. Um, so throughout the calendar year, the request for usage of reserves on new and existing allocations uh, can be made at any time. Uh, priority will be given to allocations that are currently effectively utilizing their current resources to produce publish publishable results, support students preparing dissertations, can provide concrete estimates for time required for specified runs, did not receive significant clawbacks of allocated resources, and they don't abuse the premium queue on NERSC and uh, new allocations that are connected to uh, newly granted awards. So requests for reserve hours can be made at any time, but those made after quarterly clawbacks of node hours have a pretty high chance of being accommodated. So in some cases, just uh, patience is a virtue. If you just wait, I typically am able to <coughs> accommodate some of the uh, requests throughout the year. And that's all. OK, thank you so much. Are there any questions um, online or in the room? I didn't see any online. Okay. Well, if you think of one, you can always uh, send
send it through uh, in the Q&A um, or ask it later. Um, okay, all right, so let's move on. Michael, thank you so much for your presentation. Uh, it's very helpful. Um, <clears throat> our next presenter is Eric Church from the uh, HUP allocations. Um, and yeah, feel free to take it away. Okay, it's all good? Yes, perfect, thank you. Hi, I'm, uh, I'm Eric, I'm an HP detailee. So I'm not a Fed, not a PM. Thank you for even allowing me to be at your meeting. But I am uh, effectively the allocation manager, at least uh, temporarily within HP in the last few years, I would say. Um, I need to remind you what high energy physics does. The mission is to understand uh, how the universe works at its most fundamental levels. Um, um, HP develops and supports uh, a specific portfolio of projects that makes significant contributions to facilities and experiments uh, for the program, including project management thereof, uh, supports R&D to advance state-of-the-art uh, particle accelerators and detectors that lead to new and more capable facilities and we support uh, enabling new and transformative capabilities in AI ML and QIS and cross-cutting technology areas, perhaps via SBIR. Um, and, and of course, uh, supports a vibrant theory program uh, to understand our knowledge of and extend our knowledge of uh, particles and forces. Um, DOE funds 85% of the US particle physics efforts in dollars including all, all that work at the national labs. Uh, the the um, org chart looks like this, which I only show to, for one thing, last time I showed you a rough draft of the org chart that had Regina as AD um, in my own hand scrawled writing. And now uh, I just wanted to be clear, she's been in the office for a year um, in that role. Um, and we have our own little box down here, computational HEP and AI ML on the research side, uh, where Jeremy Love is the is uh, uh, program manager. And over here on the operations side, led by Mike, um, sits the people who watch over the facilities. And and uh, particularly, I want to point out Eric Feng, whose name will come up in a minute. Um, so within HEP. Uh, we have notably uh, the so-called insensitivity frontier, uh, neutrinos, muons, et cetera, um, uh, lower energy colliders that produce flavor physics, uh, the energy frontier, which is basically the LHC and the colliders there, and the cosmic frontier full of experiments, expanding our knowledge of cosmic, ray, uh, cosmic microwave background, et cetera, and the theory program. Those are the fundamental four core energy physics research programs. Uh, beyond that, we have um, sub offices that, um, that promote work in accelerators separately, advanced detectors separately. Of course, we have our own SBIR program manager and QIS, um, which we manage within HEP ourselves, though th some of these things are uh, umbrella efforts across the Office of Science, obviously. And we have our own computational physics box, which I circled. Uh, that's uh, Jeremy and I, and uh, we manage the compute and AIML projects within HEP and things like uh, HEP's presence at NERSC that we're speaking about here today. Jeremy, as I said, is the program director, currently out on uh, parental leave until November 1st-ish, I believe, or mid-November, maybe it's December 1st, I can't remember right now. And Eric Fang, um, who's in operations. The three of us are kind of watching over allocations. And then we have a whole, that whole other side, which in which Eric sits, um, of experiment operations. That's, so that's a quick summary of the whole org chart. Um, so uh, my screen share is in my way here. Oops. Um, so, uh, new allocations, uh, I'm going to speak about uh, new allocations. 
um, and uh, basically uh, using our a A Y twenty two twenty four experience. Um, obviously, that's the mechanics of that are conducted via ERCAP. So I'll talk a little bit, show you a couple of ERCAP interfaces, and I want to thank uh, Matthias for the wonderful summary of ERCAP. Everything, basically, almost everything he said, as it applies to BES, applies to us on ERCAP applications. I think there's a little bit more regimented requirement in BES from what I heard of the one-to-one -one matching between grants and ERCAP applications that are expected to be successful than we enforce. Um, I wanna discuss a little bit about the intra allocation year rebalancing, which is done by IRIS, the IRIS system. And mainly here I'll discuss our, our last two years of experience. And uh, at the end, I want to get to the um, out year planning that we we talk about. And if only if if only I'm speaking for the sake of HEP special needs, and also the nurse super facilities. Um, both these things apply to our current large co consumers and those who are coming. Um, yeah. So uh, you know the application process doesn't really make a co accommodation for a new. Uh, large consumers in the future, but whom we know are coming. And so I want to talk a little bit about that. Um, and I'm not going to say anything about SIDAC or ALCC. Um, Michael mentioned this. Um, and it's true, the HEP also has strong involvement in SIDAC with Oscar and ALCC as well. Uh, some HEP proposals are generally accepted in those programs. And um, so full citations to Michael and Matthias before me. Let's see if I can, what is going on here? Okay, I hope that worked. Um, so in October, the ERCAP proposals are due. Uh, we anticipate just roughly 80 for coming uh, next week. Um, for AY24, uh, for HEP, asking for HEP allocations. Um, you know, I could be wrong by a factor of 1.5 or two, but that's that's kind of what we saw in 22-23. Uh, Jeremy, Eric Fang, and I will filter them for relevance to HEP. Um, uh, that is, some things which are not obviously in our program mission may be filtered at this step. And here I should say that all HEP proposals for anything, for, uh, for any FOA, are encouraged to uh, abide by the so-called P5 um, overarching framework that HEP looks for to be satisfied for all the work that's done in the program. So this is the, the planning exercise that was conducted sort of in 2014 and is being reconducted and about to be unveiled again <laughs> in, uh, at the very end here of 2023. So everybody has to conform to basically the mission of the office as as uh, codified in the P5 report. Um, for example, some esoteric astrophysics studies may not conform. Uh, gravitational waves work, um, which I point out is uh, the, at the facilities are entirely funded by NSF. Um, some, you could imagine some theory studies that might work their way in, but we look at those closely. Uh, sometimes we get some mistargeted things that are really intended or appropriate for fusion or nuclear physics. And, and um, so step one is to redirect those proposals. This is the sort of summary of what we saw last year for AY23 requests. This is, you'll note the ERCAP uh, request where uh, we had <clears throat> about 2.6 uh, million node hours in reserve to start. And, and we were asked to, um, to disseminate 3.2 of those. That's the sum of the ERCAP applications. So um, not multiple factors, as um, Matthias said, BES faces, who has, I'd note, about two times this in allocations in reserves. Um, but it's still competitive. It, um, and so this form, I'm not showing all of it. It continues on below, for example, the GPU requests which uh, are not on this page, it's a different page. Um, those requests in 23 summed about to what was available for us to allocate out. Are you guys having this problem that you see my banner here? 
No, we don't. We, we okay. see the slides completely. It just means I can't quite see the top row. Um, so uh, this is down from the, here. Here you see the 24, 23, 22 uh, reserves that we have in hand on the, the number not in parentheses. Um, and, the, and then the number in parentheses is the demand from the ERCAP proposals uh, in, in 25. I'm, no, I'm sorry, that's wrong, that's wrong. The, the number not in parentheses is CPUs. The, the number in parentheses is, uh, is uh, at least for 24, this is GPU. Let me, um, I confused myself here. That 1.6 is a typo. So so in fact, it is, it is that which we have to allocate out in reserve and that which is requested except for 24, which is a typo. I know that we have 3.0 uh, million node hours of CPU. Uh, to allocate out in 24, and we don't know yet what the uh, what the demand is. Um, but the increase in 23 and the demand over uh, what was available is the effect of Corey going away, which for which we tried to prepare the HP community. So the um, the CPU request came down into 23, and we don't know what's going to happen in 24. As I said, um, not because people need less CPU, but because we have gone through the planning to manage the pain. Uh, we had gone through the pain to manage the pain of Corey's decommissioning, and 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 we had urged a lot of people to 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 really take seriously porting their code to GPU. And um, so anyway, this is just a repeat that we were we were about twenty percent over requested for CPU. Here's a snapshot of of the eighty AY twenty two proposals, and and just um, drilling down into one in particular. I, I uh, this is a proposal. Um, uh, for um, from from um, basically Ruben, the Ruben and the Dark Energy Survey camera. Um, what I want to show you is there's never a shortage of Berkeley LBL proposals. Um, if we go and click on this one, which is actually from Slack, um, you see what um, they that's what they asked for. Here's what they got and what they're using. And I just, these, these plots are nice to see CPU on top, GPU on the bottom. You just get to see if people are on the linear trajectory toward completing. And when we see, when we see this kind of thing where our heart is warmed, this is a 10,000, they had a 10,000 node hour request, which is, uh, you know, typical humble, uh, but big enough to get a lot of work done. And, um, they're on track to use it uh, linearly, meaning they they're watching this to themselves surely, and that they're under using the GPU. So this this we find is pretty typical uh, that people are on their CPU pace and lagging on their GPU pace. I really sorry, <laughs> uh, but this is one this is one we expect one of these days. Who knows? It could be AY twenty three. We don't think so from what we've heard out of twenty four that will suddenly hit us with a times 10 request, a hundred thousand node out request. And, and at which point you're a big player. Um, so our top 10 projects use 85% of our allocation. The top three would ha happily gobble up the entire HCB allocation. Um, so it's our job to work with them in advance such that expectations are reasonable. Um, if we're oversubscribed again in AY24, uh, whittling away at the biggest users is the easiest way to squeeze in all reasonable allocations, meaning that that extra oversubscription I told about, uh, at least a lot of that can be accommodated if we whittle away at these, at these heavy users. So we'll find out next week the extent to which we're oversubscribed and the extent to which we get some surprising large ones. And that's always what makes us stop in our tracks and, and consider the budget, the time budget. But here roughly are guidelines um, that we follow to accommodate or cap requests. Uh, we first and foremost have obligations to cosmic frontier experiments. These are the big collaborations who generally uh, run instruments at observatories and and we must try to meet them because a couple few years ago um hp and oscar um was used and you know nurse therefore was urged by production uh operation research managers um to be the facility at which these big collaborations do their computing 
um, for efficiency of resource usage reasons. And so the agreement between the previous HEP and Oscar ADs was that <clears throat> some of these big collaborations ought to really use NERSC. So we, we accommodate these uh, to the extent we can entirely. And we then generally accommodate modest requests fully, particularly if there's a history of using previous allocations or uh, there's a publication history. A lot of these are in the noise, really, with respect to the total sum. Uh, historically, large, efficient power users making large requests, again, are accommodated with some communication in advance. Uh, if they come in with a year-over-year -year request that suddenly goes to, say, 30%, that requires a conversation. Large requests from users with a history of not using allocations uh, or using them inefficiently in the past will get uh, scaled back allocations. Uh, we, we, whenever there's a question that's tough for us, we run our proposal by the program managers. So this is perhaps a little bit differently than we heard from two previous speakers. Uh, the three of us will try to manage the the acceptance of RCAP proposals until we start seeing things that look odd to us. And that's basically because we have already communicated with the program managers and we know their expectations. And we hold back sort of 15% CPU and, and GPU for later allocation during the year because um, we always want to have something in our back pocket for surprises that come during the year. Um, and anyway, similar considerations for GPU and storage. Uh, and one thing I yeah was pointing out that in AY22, the GPU and Perlmutter was uncharged for big parts and, and even into 23, that was true. Um, so during, during the year, NERSC makes their own adjustments as has been discussed, clawing back from under year users. This is sort of quarterly, as Michael said, we come in ourselves around September, October, uh, which we I have just been doing, uh, and make our own adjustments, clawing back from users under a certain CPU, G GPU usage, those people not on the linear line uh, or way below it, offering, uh, and we offer to add to those who are above some threshold if we have it. You always get points for maximizing the charged machine usage. That means you're a savvy users of the queues and the, and the discount holidays. Um, um, and, and of course, any recent publications or impending publications, which we know are important to the community, um, are uh, those, those projects are rewarded. But there's a lot of communication back and forth. Nobody is surprised. Um, you know, if, for example, if there are good reasons for projects who are in an underuse state, we generally don't take any action. There are a lot of good reasons for that. Postdocs leave to industry all of a sudden in a surprise or, you know, data came in late or, you know, something. Um, we also do epsilon tuning in November and December. So right toward the end of the year, we want to make sure that resources get used. All that kind of stuff is done on the IRIS system. Um, I should say, you know, a lot of discussion with nurse management goes in and Richard in particular, uh, a very valuable uh, iteration with um, those guys. So, um, right. So here I'm sorting by the uh, allocation uh, size. This is a this is an iris tabulation, sorting um, our top users, and um, this stuff is under my banner again. But I um, I. It's not sorting by the thing the arrow is pointing to. It's sorting by the um, uh, the charge uh, by the allocation, the, the leftmost column, and then you see the charge, uh, which yeah, and then the the fraction of the allocation is the charge column, um, and the the that average charge column again, uh, we like to see uh, be low, right? Yeah. Well, we like to see that below. That means you're savvy with the cues. So um, we know that at this state of this um, of this uh, when, when I took this snapshot, that some some users have pegged the needle already three months before the AY end, and uh, we know that some groups 
appetites insatiable we've given to those people and they're still pegging the needle. Um, and we also note that um, storage increased requests are not done by us. I guess maybe that's something that everyone knows, but um, that is true. We, we usually go um, urge people to submit another ERCAP application or we urge them to get in touch with Clayton and Richard and team for their storage requests. Um, so this is now a discussion about um, out years usage, future years. In the, so in the past few years, we've held discussions with about eight of our historically heavy users. For example, the, uh, the big uh, linear header and collider experiments and the lattice QCD projects, and there are others. Um, and this is for our benefit. NERSC is uninterested in the out years. They take the ERCAP year by year. Um, but the one year at a time thing doesn't always line up with our users' compute patterns. And I know this is true across the Office of Science, but it helps us to know what we're facing in advance of the ERCAP deadline. So uh, we have asked these, uh, these projects that I identify above and others um, for their anticipated usage in the next three years. And I think this has been really helpful to us. Um, well, we've, in fact, asked for some of this language to go into their ERCAP proposals. And this is all part of the process of urging people toward ever more GPU usage. I mean, it is true that some groups are more GPU prepared than others, and it's important um, that they become more and more so to take advantage of the machines at NERSC. Um, the Lattice QCD projects are good examples of people who, who not only are insatiable in their CPU demands, but also in their GPU demands, and that's a good thing. <laughs> um, all right, so I'm getting toward the end here. I, um, after all this great things that our project managers, managers ahead of me said, and what I should be emphasizing all along, that this machine, uh, Perlmutter, has been a magnificent machine for science and HEP. Um, there have been some <clears throat> pickups with our collaborations who count on Perlmutter for their operations and spin. Um, so I, I have reached out to a couple of them just to make some remarks here that improvements in the post Perlmutter acceptance era uh, has been notable and marked. And uh, everybody is grateful for the new, you know, uh, new stability in this era. Um, for example, interactive Jupyter nodes now re remain up uh, during scheduled down downtimes, which turns out to be a massive uh, bonus for some people who need to continually have access to uh, interactive nodes to do their operations. Um, uh, it has been pointed out to me that 20% of the, for example, DAISY uh, promoter jobs still die nightly, which seems low, but uh, is a problem if you don't complete that full 100%. Uh, you know, in order to understand operations for um, uh, the next night's operations. So LZ is another experiment who, who's had great, um, made great use of the spin nodes, but have noticed uh, DB failures and outside network policy problems that have prevented this from being, you know, uh, seamless. Not entirely sure they would recommend people to uh, conduct their operations with DBs, databases that run on spin. The increasing wall clock limit to 24 hours just for a handful of queues has been very welcomed and I guess not entirely seamlessly accomplished. Uh, everyone is excited that Perl, Perlmutter on demand is coming. So machines that are up all the time, I guess. Um, and, and also everyone wants to point out that the nurse staff has been very engaged in helping and, and making uh, you know problems get solved, help, helping problems get solved. So we see we see in HEP more collaborations coming to the super facility model. <clears throat> Excuse me. And so uptime and reliability, which admittedly is never guaranteed and was never promised, uh, becomes crucial. And and we hope these lessons are taken to heart for NERSC ten, for example, which is of course only two to three more years down the road. And that's that's the end of what I have to say. Thanks. Thank you so much. Um, are there any questions in the room? Um, if not, there is one online. <clears throat> and 
I'm not sure how well we'll be able to answer this, but um, there, there's a question that's asking, do you have numbers about node hours requested slash delivered by other HPC facilities, so ALCF and OLCF, and how does that compare to NERSC? Okay. Um, yeah, that's going to be for someone else to answer. I think the point is that the Office of Sciences could control at least some amount of reserves uh, every year at NERSC. As to ALCF, you know, Frontier and Aurora, um, I think those mostly go through ALCC and IRIS, the, the DOE, you know, the Office of Science usage, and the rest I can't speak to. Sure. Okay. Richard is coming up to address this. I, I can say a little bit about that. It's, 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 it's kind of a apples to oranges comparison because the, um, most of the time at the at ALCF and OLCF is um, allocated through the Insight program and then the ALCC program, which actually has 20%. Um, and both of those are competitive um, programs, but they don't have uh, Kind of a a percentage of the program committed to any given science area or any given office um, and that sort of thing so i suspect for somebody um, like eric or some of the different offices they probably see um, considerable fluctuation from year to year about how many of their projects are supported on those systems um, so uh, it's not it, yeah it's not quite it's not quite the same question so at nurse they do have a a kind of guaranteed number of hours every year, but they, they don't at the leadership facilities. I can say I, I got a uh, I got myself an allocation with a small group on Summit three years ago at a director's discretion, which just was easy to go get, but it wasn't enormous. Right? If you're asking for something enormous, you may be, uh, yeah, you have to go to the super competitive ALCC or Insight programs. Yeah, Peter wants to say something. Yeah. One of the key differences between NERSC and, and OLCF and um, ALCF is that NERSC has an enormously large user base, it's about 10,000 users. ALCF and OLCF have about a 1,000 accounts, and the number of projects on those machines, the number of inside projects is of the order of 20, 30 per institution, but with significantly more CPU hours or GPU hours now um, than is available at NERSC. So it's, it's, there are certainly groups that run at those, but, and I'm one of those, but the super large runs I do at Argo. We'll see what's over Aurora. So that, yeah. that's the key difference between I mean, them. I, I might add my, my, we have an HEP, we have two or three of these collaborations, which are the super facility category, who do themselves have what a couple hundred users each which is a little surprising right i think that is very hard to pull off at the other cfs lcfs and uh uh i had another comment i wanted to make about that uh, yeah uh the coming iri thing right the oscar iri thing may change the way in which allocations across the lcfs are are used too i would okay. say Great. Any other questions before we move to our last allocation manager presentation? I don't see anything online yet. Okay. Thank you so much, Eric. All right. Thank you. Great presentation. Thank you. Okay. Next, we have uh, Renu Joseph, who is presenting for uh, BER. Um, and, I'm, and I will, uh, yeah, perfect. I'll let you take it away. Thank you so much. Okay, can you see the screen I just lost? Yes. Uh, I have no visual with the rest of the... Uh, uh, yeah, it looks perfect. Yeah. Okay, great. Um, so good morning and good afternoon, uh, everyone. This, um, if, I mean, going last, you always end up seeing all the points that you wanted to make and the uh have already been made and this is re-emphasizing many of that uh so um a meeting like this also shows the similarities in which we are allocating across the office of science so um this is actually a tag team presentation between me uh Renu joseph uh who is the allocation manager for, for nurse for the earth and environmental system scientist division 
and uh, my colleague, uh, Ramana, and I'll ask her to introduce herself and uh, we are doing a tag team presentation. Thanks, Reno. Um, good afternoon, good morning, everyone. And uh, thanks for the opportunity to, to speak to you all today. Uh, my name is Ramana Madupu. I am a program manager also within BER. Um, the other division, the Biological System Sciences Division, and I am the Allocation Manager for NERSC within BSSD. Next slide. Yeah, this is the customary slide we, we show at uh, you know, all, all external presentations, but you know, as uh, Renu and I uh, sit within the Office of Biological and Environmental Research, BER, which is one of the offices, uh, one of the six offices under the umbrella of Office of Science. Uh, the office of BER consists of two divisions, uh, the Biological System Science Division and Earth and Environmental System Science Division. Um, and Todd Anderson, who's normally the division director for BSSD is now uh, the acting uh, director for uh, for BER, and uh, so hence uh, we have an acting director for BSSD, Donna Dean. Um, we are soon to get a, a permanent um, associate director, um, which was announced last week, and uh, we will be starting next month, I believe. Um, and uh, EESSD, uh, where Reno sits, uh, is led by uh, Gary Gienard. Um, BER also, uh, other than supporting basic uh, science uh, efforts in energy and environmental research, also supports uh, national scientific user facilities, and we'll talk a little bit more about it in the uh, next slides. So um, what we have decided to do is first go through what EESSD is doing, first talk about the science priorities so that the applicants uh, are aware of it, and I'm sure most of uh, the applicants for the upcoming ERCAP will be aware of the priorities. But then after that, we'll talk about what we are looking for with respect to the ERCAP applications. So starting with uh, EESSD or the Earth and Environmental Systems Sciences Division, uh, the reason for the focus on understanding the earth and environmental system sciences is because of its relevance uh, to uh, under, uh, energy infrastructure. Uh, earth system variability, um, like modes of variability like El Nino uh, 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 and many other modes of variability affect um, the inf energy infrastructure. And so uh, from the short-term modes of variability to long-term climate change, and then the short, very short-term extreme events that affect the energy infrastructure, it makes it relevant to, un, uh, to focus and understand what is happening with, with respect to this in the Earth system. So this requires long-term basic research investments in physical, biological, human, and mathemat mathematical sciences uh, that would both include uh, intense field observations and, and modeling capabilities. And so we do all that within our division. Um, so um, I'm not going to read out the mission and vision of our division, but uh, Overall, I, we are focusing on improving the understanding of predictability of the Earth system on timescales ranging from seasonal to multi-decadal uh, to inform <coughs> the energy strategies. And for that, we do have the long-term field experiments, the intense observations, and the various modeling capabilities that will help us understand the uncertainties also within the Earth. Earth system predictability. And um, when you think about the uh, overarching EESSD activities, um, we came up with a strategic plan a, a few years ago that had priorities on understanding the water cycle, understanding biogeochemical cycles, uh, high latitude uh, feedbacks and interactions, 
and then drivers and responses, and also an intense uh, uh, focus on bringing observations and models together. So these are the general themes that you need to think of when you, as you apply uh, for ERCAP. Um, the um, science drivers within our division consists of the main uncertainties within the Earth system, and particularly in, in Earth system models. The, the main uncertainties are around cloud aerosol precipitation interactions, um, and, and, and that changes the range of projections quite a bit. Also, there's a lot of uncertainty in understanding the uh, carbon cycle and the biogeochemical cycles within the Earth system. So that uh, is also a focus of uh, uh, the division. And we do have long-term observations and models that address these. And um, it's also important to uh, think of Earth system uh, models that go across scales from the very fine process scale representations to the coarser, larger uh, 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 capabilities. And so you do bring in observations and models together to be able to uh, address the predictive nature of the Earth system. So, so far, talked about the na natural system more, but an important aspect of the Earth system is also the human aspect. So understanding the interactions with, and representing the interactions between the natural and the human system is also very important. Um, so these, uh, this slide kind of focuses on the different capabilities in terms of observational capabilities that are there. And uh, this particular slide focuses on the modeling uh, resources. And I'm gonna focus a little bit more on this slide just because uh, we, uh, the modeling group uses most, uh, most uh, or a lot of the NERSC resources that are allocated to the division. So as part of Earth and Environmental Systems modeling, um, the uh, flagship model is the energy exascale Earth system model. And it's uh, the first model in the world that has success successfully been run on the exascale machine. Uh, and it's the atmospheric component of E3SM that has done that. So, um, uh, um, uh, and uh, in the modeling program, we do have three foci. One focuses on model development that contributes to E3SM. We also focus on using E3SM and a hierarchy and a suite of modeling tools uh, to uh, jointly understand the Earth system. So Earth system model analysis. And I'm the program manager who's uh, cognizant program manager for that part of the uh, modeling portfolio. And then you also have a focus on understanding the interactions between the natural and the human system. So uh, that said, you've gotten a big picture idea of the uh, priorities in the division. And now when it comes to NERSC allocations, um, one of the important things is to figure out who is the cognizant program manager for the, your particular application? So on the left, you see the focus on the atmospheric systems. And you have two program managers, uh, Shaima uh, Nasiri and Jeff Stir there. You have a focus on the uh, uh, ARM, that is the atmospheric radiation measurement facility with Sally McFarlane being the program manager there. There's a focus on the Terrestrial, on the right, uh, you see the focus on the terrestrial component of the Earth system that uh, Brian Benz Carter and Dan Stover are managing. And um, the other uh, uh, facility, which is the Environmental Molecular Sciences Laboratory facility managed by Paul Bayer. And um, so those two programs that I've uh, talked about uh, and the facilities that I've talked about fo focus on the atmospheric and the terrestrial uh, components of the Earth system. 
The modeling is seen as the indicate integrator within our division. And there are th the, the, the three program managers here. Um, Zhujing Davis is uh, primarily responsible, is responsible for the energy exascale earth system model development. I'm the program manager who's responsible for using that model to understand the uh, earth system. So all the long-term simulations that are done with E3SM and a suite of other models are part of my portfolio and Bob Valario manages the interactions between the natural and the human system. We have the data management uh, uh, program that is managed by Jay Nilo, and that's also an important part of our division. Um, so you have an idea of the program managers, and uh, I, I just thought one way to uh, show how we come about our decisions is to showing you is to show you pie charts of how uh, the requests are spread uh, throughout uh, based on the program priorities within EESSD. So um, this is not a reflection of the number of funding awards with respect to money, um, but the, this is just the ERCAP uh, projects that I'm highlighting here. And as expected. Um, these three areas together uh, form the modeling area that um, has the largest number of uh, 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 projects and the largest number of uh, lead PIs. And then the terrestrial and the atmospheric uh, groups have uh, a smaller number of P uh, projects, uh, but it's significant. And the thing is, altogether, as of now, we do have 113 individual projects. Um, again, this is a large number to manage, and I'll show you why uh, in our particular case. So one thing, just like many of the program managers, uh, many of the talks emphasized earlier, we request one uh, ERCAP uh, request per award or per, uh, you know, per uh, university award or per lab award. So um, that is one request that we are putting out there. Now, I also want to show you the uh, distribution of the CPU usage. I'm focusing on CPU usage here because with respect to GPUs, we, uh, our division is very undersubscribed. I mean, uh, we have a lot of GPUs that uh, are not being utilized. So if any of the pro projects do want to use GPUs effectively, please indicate it in your application. And uh, please do, we encourage you to work with the NERSC team to uh, make your code compatible so that you can use GPUs. But with respect to CPUs, if you just look at the uh, initial CPUs requested, it was 14 million. When we have a total allocation of about 2.3 uh, uh, million. Uh, so it, it is nearly seven times uh, oversubscribed. And so that is a very difficult challenge to deal with, uh, particularly with 100 projects uh, and, and and so and so we have what we've done so far is to systematically reduce projects that haven't used uh, their time effectively before. We have also worked on uh, uh, scaling the all the requests by a factor so that we can uh, effectively use the system and uh, give ev every user. Uh, um, some allocation at least. So, um, and if you look at the uh, this graph, you do see that it's a log plot with modeling being the largest user. And um, in so uh, emphasizing that there needs to be a reasonable amount in the ask, uh, I just thought uh, I'd split modeling into the three areas and put it on a regular plot. And the analysis part of the portfolio, 
Uh, unfortunately, the part that I'm uh, I'm responsible for is the largest has the largest ask. And what we've done over co the course of time, um, and uh, this is since uh, the last year, particularly every two months, I've had to go in in the first six months of the year till about June or July. Every two months, I have to go in and reallocate um, because people have the large users have already finished up their resources, and we do keep some in reserve so that. Uh, the new projects and people who've run out of resources get some time. So you find that almost all project, uh, all pro programs have had an increase in their allocation based on the larger users. But there are lots of users who haven't used their uh, time uh, and their resources appropriately. So um, a reminder, be reasonable in your ask of uh, the ERCAP resources. Uh, make sure that uh, where appropriate, use GPU resources. And particularly for FY23, if you are out of your allocation and you want more resources, please do send an email. Um, now I've reached the stage where every two weeks I'm logging in and reallocating um, uh, or providing resources to projects that have exhausted their resources. So uh, very quickly, um, summary from the uh, EESSD side, GPUs are underutilized. CPUs in FY23 have uh, been um, oversubscribed by a factor of about six or more um, and um, request resources when you run out. In FY23, for, for the new ERCAP res, uh, resources, please do make a reasonable request based on actual usage. Identify the correct cognizant program manager. I've, I've, I've put the pictures of uh, all the program managers on the chart before. Uh, there is a lot of frustration for program managers when they find that the wrong program manager has been um, uh, referenced in the uh, NERSC award. So um, please do identify the uh, correct Cognizant Program Manager, identify the correct DOE award that is funding you, or the, make the award number the correct one, uh, because we look at all that to be able to uh, make decisions. Uh, and allocation is, uh, the priorities first go to the uh, people who are using their resources appropriately in FY23. For um, then um, uh, also it it's for every DOE funded award we try to make resources available, um, and then we prioritize uh, interagency collaborations where we work with other agencies. So. We um, prioritize uh, that work along with work that goes on in the labs, like the LDRD projects that are relevant to our division's mission. And then we, as the other program managers indicated, we really uh, need to see how you've used your nurse resources in the past and for that, in your publications, please do acknowledge NERSC uh, as you go forward. And I'm turning it over to Ramana right now. Thanks. Thanks, Renu. Um, so I will also describe, as Renu did, uh, some of the priorities of the on the biology side of the house, uh, which is the other division within BER, the biological system sciences uh, division. Um, the um, BSST subprogram uh, employs systems biology approaches to define the fundamental functional principles that drive living systems from microbes, microbial communities to plants and other whole organisms. So the key, key questions that we are trying to um, answer are studies uh, that involve looking at what information is encoded in the genome sequences of these organisms and how this information is exchanged between various subcellular uh, components and constituents 
and what molecular interactions regulate the response of living organisms on living systems and how, how those interactions can be understood um, dynamically and predictably. Um, the other important aspect of our program is how can we employ uh, biosystems design, synthetic biology approaches uh, to deduce underlying principles so that we can redesign and optimize uh, metabolic pathways within plants and microorganisms for beneficial purposes. So overall, the BSSD program employs various approaches to understand the complex living systems. We use genome sequencing, proteomics, metabolomics, uh, structural biology techniques, as well as high resolution imaging and characterization and integrating all this information into computational models so that we can iteratively test and validate for uh, developing uh, predictive understanding of these biological systems from you know, mesoscale to um, from molecular level to the mesoscale level. Next slide, please. So um, overall, the, the scientific goal for BSSD program portfolio is, is to support basic research as well as technology development to understand the genetics of plants, microbes, and microbial communities so as to be able to design and modify and optimize them for beneficial purposes. Uh, how can we understand the, uh, to understand and identify plants and microbes so that we, they can be used for the production of biofuels uh, and bioproducts from their uh, from the biomass from from plants, and also to understand biological processes that control the flux of materials that that are in the environment and how they impact the ecosystems. So, um, as I mentioned earlier, BSSD supports programs in new imaging and analytical technologies. Uh, the BSST program also supports the National Scientific User Facility, the Joint Genome Institute, which is also located at uh, LBNL, uh, is supported out of BER. And um, also BSST supports um, user science focused on structural biology uh, capabilities that include crystallography, scattering, spectroscopy, imaging, uh, cryo-electron microscopy, at the National Neutron and Light Sources, which are also user, user facilities. So as, as you can see, um, BSST programs are um, multidisciplinary, quantitative, and data-centric. We are a very rich uh, um, genomic and omic-centric program, uh, which is pro focused on DOE's mission in bioenergy, biosystems design, and environmental science with very, very large uh, data analysis needs. Which, which are very different from, from what we've heard earlier this morning. Um, next slide, uh, Renu. Next slide. Yeah. So um, BER, BSSD supports uh, several uh, user facilities and community uh, focused resources. These provide uh, services to anyone within the research community, not only to uh, DOE scientists. So BER strongly um, encourages collaboration among its user facilities to engage in cross-cutting research efforts that use multiple uh, DOE's resources. For example, um, BER's Joint Genome Institute that provides capabilities in DNA sequencing and interpretation and manipulation, as well as DNA synthesis, partners with EMSL, the Environmental Molecular Sciences Laboratory, which is operated out of uh, Pacific Northwest National Lab, EMSL provides capabilities to understand biological and environmental processes across temporal and spatial scales. So these two user facilities come together and annually issue joint solicitations. These are specifically tailored to research projects that leverage capabilities at uh, both user facilities. Uh, similarly, several collaborative programs are ongoing with, uh, between uh, KBase, uh, the DOE Systems Biology Knowledge Base, KBase and JGI, KBase and EMSL, uh, and also includes uh, National Microbiome Data Collaborative NMDC program. So the goal for BSSD is to develop um, an integrated data science ecosystem for biological sciences that enables and advances uh, data discovery and collaborative science. So BSSD programs overall need to integrate very, very large data sets across varying 
spatial and temporal scales uh, so as they can be and um, they are able to extract uh, meaningful um, information from large heterogeneous data sets so the the compute needs are 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 uh, very different from what we've heard and linking these different types of data sets and again with with structural biology data protein data with uh, network interactions models so, uh, so as to be able to predict uh, protein interactions and small molecule docking within living systems. So the, the programs and researchers are um, reliant on OSCAR facilities that provide um, enhanced mid-range and high-performance computing resources that are tailored to large-scale uh, integrative data science. Next slide, please. So uh, you've heard from various programs this morning, but um, the, the biological sciences sub-program has, has a very, very small allocation at NERSC, which, which accounts to about only 2% of the total Office of Science allocation. But these resources are very, very important for our program that produce cutting edge science. And um, I also want to convey to this group that these needs are, uh, are growing, um, constantly and uh, there's more and more uh, requirement for um, resources at NERSC and other, other uh, high performance computing centers. And um, the, the other uh, point I wanted to make is with uh, the effect of Cori going away, uh, I think um, Eric talked about it a little bit. Um, it has had um, a, a somewhat of a significant um, effect on, on, on the JGI operations. Uh, JGI use, uses NERSC a quarter of the allocation, as you can see here um, in this uh, chart, uh, JGI gets about a quarter of the allocation for uh, all from BSSD's um, NERSC um, resources. And uh, JGI had to um, move away from NERSC and develop their, um, um, their own uh, compute uh, requirements to, to be able to run their uh, um, workflows. Um, but uh, I, I put up this chart here just to show that a BSSD allocation is distributed uh, across various labs and uh, also with, within um, academic institutions and universities. Um, universities get about a quarter of the allocation from uh, entire BSSD resources. Next slide. Uh, again, I don't want to belabor the same points that have been made by uh, other program managers here. Um, yeah, um, I, the request for um, proposal submitters for annual RCAP, RCAP requests, um, please include correct project and program manager uh, information and uh, please estimate your ask reasonably because historically within BSSD uh, projects have seen that um, people ask for way more resources than they can really use. And uh, we have been able to uh, transfer um, node hours between within uh, BER, uh, I would transfer to the uh, EESSD programs um, almost every year, um, you know, periodically. So um, yeah, it's, it, I think so So far our programs are able to use up the allocations uh, pretty uh, pretty well within within uh, the given uh, NERSC allocation. Um, but um, I think um, the large programs, especially JGI and the Protein Data Bank um, have, have uh, larger requirements um, we are looking at for um, AI24. Um, so it remains to be seen how, how that distribution happens. Um, I think, um, lastly, I just wanted to, next slide, um, just wanted to thank the nurse team. Uh, they've been very, very helpful. And I always reach out, send emails, and I, I get a response almost immediately. So I really want to thank the nurse team for all the help that they've provided uh, over the years, uh, not only, you know, to the users, but to, to the program staff. So I'd, I'd also like to uh, join Ramana in thanking uh, the nurse team. They've been very helpful. Thanks. Great. Well, thank you so much. That was a very uh, comprehensive presentation. Um, so we appreciate that. Um, so we're we're a little over, but um, if if you're happy to stick around, there is one. Um, 
sort of interesting question from Koichi um, in the Q&A that I thought I would raise. Um, so I think the question is about the fact that during the ERCAP process, the users are essentially informing, you know, at least the DOE managers about, um, you know, what kinds of codes or applications, workflows they're going to be using. And that information, if it was sort of summarized or available, could be really useful to NERSC, um, in particular for sort of our user engagement um, uh, uh, projects. And so the question is kind of, you know, how, it, it, does any of that information come come back to NERSC? Um, you know, we, I mean, we have monitoring on the systems. We try to keep track of what people are doing, but um, is there, you know, wh what what does that communication look like? What kind of data uh, is available? Um, and then I guess Koichi is sort of asking, is there, you know, funding available for these kind of special interest activities? I see Richard coming okay. to the front, so. I was going to let you answer first if you wanted to. One thing I want to say is that uh, we keep in touch with uh, the NERSC uh, team, uh, particularly Richard Clayton and others have been very helpful. So we do uh, inform them about our needs and work with them. So Richard, what you have to say has a lot more uh, weight to it. Okay. Um, yes, we actually, actually NERSC does have um, some of this, in, well, NERSC actually has a lot of this information, and, and so some of, some of this knowledge is probably held by the program managers too, um, but we did start last year, we haven't completed um, a program to go through each office and try to answer just the questions you asked, like what are the applications, uh, we're trying to get a handle on workflows, we have less good handle on that, because that's harder, to, that's harder to derive from logs. Um, but the, the Nurse 10 team is going to be looking at workflows a lot. So we do have this, and we actually went through with BES, and we performed this exercise, and we have a presentation we probably should share, but we, we shared it with the program managers and, and talked about um, what the most common applications were and what their GPU readiness status was um, and that sort of thing. And then we also did this with Fusion, uh, with FES. So we have plans to do this with the other offices, too. Um, we haven't decided on a schedule yet, but if any other offices are interested in being next, we'd be happy to work with you on that. Matthias, did you have a comment? Please feel free to. Oh, sure, yeah. Uh, well, R Richard basically is, is, is said on what we have done so far. So we have been proactive in this uh, issue. And we, we use this information uh, as, as Richard described, A, just to see on where is the, the most uh, usage but then also from our program side, uh, we want to know which software is the most uh, used. And to some extent, it's because within BES, we're also developing software. We have software centers. And so we want to know, uh, is, is that software being accepted by the community? So we, we track that. So this is at this point only internal, uh, but uh, NERSC and NERSC staff has helped us a lot to sort of see where it goes. There's still questions like, for example, when, when Richard and his team say, well, VASP is the, the primary electronic structure DFT code being used at NERSC, that doesn't tell us exactly how it's being used. And this is also not clear from, uh, now here I blame the applicants, it's not clear from the ERCAP proposal. Uh, it's it, because it can be used in many modalities and it, in the end it can be just a fancy first principles MD simulation tool and that can eat any amount you can throw at it. So it doesn't tell us really how it's being used. This would be something to to be to be worth checking in the future. And uh, we said we, we this is a process that we started with Richard and, and the NERSC team and uh, we hope to to get more information, especially for which software should be made available at the NERSC application system side. And so we're looking forward to more coming along this line. Thank you. Yeah uh, you know that's an interesting question that we've actually thought about um, we're trying trying to think about in one idea we had, and, and let me know if you're interested in, in maybe spinning up some kind of a collaboration on this is perhaps using AI or other um, statistical methods to be able to look at, say, VASP, um, various signatures that we can figure out what is important and interesting and be able to categorize the different kinds of algorithms that are being employed um, during different runs. And then that might be able to to help us tell kind of which you know, how it's being used um, and, 
and programs like VASP and other other similar things can, um, as you know, be used in a number of different modalities that have different resource re resource requirements and do better or worse in certain kind of architectures and all that kind of thing. Michael, did you want to add anything? If not, that's okay. Nope. No. So, okay. Please. Okay, great. Great. All right. Well, thank you so much. Um, thank you so much to our allocation managers for making these great presentations. Um, our goal is to get these, uh, you know, the recording for today's session uh, posted soon so that other users who weren't able to attend can uh, can get this information before they submit their ORCAPs, uh, which are due next week. So uh, thank you so much. We're going to take a break for about 20 minutes. And then when we come back, we're going to have some of our first user talks. Um, and I'm really looking forward to that. So see you back in 20 minutes.